That is a very interesting question. Uh, can I suggest we take the other three questions, then we let the panel respond to, uh, to uh, all the questions. The next on my list is Romeo from Uganda. After Romeo is Luisa from Guatemala. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry I can't climb up there. I'm limping a bit. I thank ISFIT for this program. My name is Romeo. I come from Uganda. And practically I'm a medical student in my fourth year. Yeah, I have around three issues. The first issue is policy. I think the most important program that we as students could look out is policy. A lot of aid, a lot of money is being sent to developing countries, but these monies are corrupted by corrupt governments. This money is diverted into defense, into um, other sectors, leaving out the education and health sectors. So I feel policy is playing a very big role in our in, in lowering the, the maternal and uh, child health. Secondly, is religion and culture. I happen to be a medical student, as I said, and in one of the situations I had in my community placements was that a very educated man refused a blood transfusion because he's a, um, a Jehovah Witness and the mother or the, the, the pregnant woman could not take blood transfusion because the, the, the religion is against it. Secondly, is culture. Some cultures actually don't agree another man to touch a woman who is going to deliver. How can a woman go and deliver in a hospital? The woman is weak, a woman cannot, um, is, is not um, a strong woman. So I believe what are we as uh, developing world and uh, the other people who don't believe maybe in cultures, how, how are you going to help countries that actually are deep into religion and culture in improving maternal health and child health? Thank you very much. Um, maybe we tend to think of culture as static, Culture is actually evolving all the time. Um, so we'll, we'll keep that question and we'll give it to the panel before we finalize. Eloisa from Guatemala to be followed by Kendra from Women and Children, I think it's WS. So if you can please make ready. So as it was said, I'm from Guatemala. I don't know if you have been there. If not, you're well invited. Um, so when I heard Tecnico in Cirugia, I thought about our midwives, who are women that are not actually uh, prepared. I mean, they haven't worked with doctors nor at the hospital. They are just like based on tradition, and they have acquired those, uh, that through years. So they're just trained to deliver babies. Our rate when babies are born and women um, are attended is not that high. Women don't die. However, the babies do. So I was thinking that we are speaking about much more work. So my question is, do you think that just training midwives to deliver babies and be like well prepared and have different methods is just um, really important? Or is it more important to really prepare them as since the baby, since the conception? Because I think that babies that are dying and women are not dying is an indicator that what really is happening is that they don't have enough vitamins and that they need treatment since they are pregnant, not when they're always going to have the baby. So that's it. Thank you. Then we come to the last uh, question from Kendra. Thank you guys for coming to this plenary session. I'm one of the workshop leaders for women and children. Um, we were so lucky to have Professor Arul Kaman um, to come and speak with us. And I wish that you guys can shock the audience a little bit about what really goes on um, when women are suffering in uh, regions where maternal health isn't up here. Um, could you guys give us some 
some graphics. Can you explain to us what really goes on? You explained uh, you have the mortality, which is the tip of the iceberg, and you have the morbidity, which is underneath. Can you give us some shocking graphics so that people can know what we're really talking about? Thank you. I do think you will have to give those shocking uh, graphics, graphs in, in words, but I do think also we heard about the, the lifetime risk, which is so staggering um, and, and so shocking. And maybe I should also add that we're talking about the dead, very important, the ones who get their health ruined, very important. But what is not so often talked about is the control of women when they know that sex for one party is dead serious in so many ways and not for the other, what kind of control that involves over women's lives? It's not just, it's not, it's bad enough, it's terrible for those who die, it's terrible for those who get sick. But the control of all women is also part of this, this picture. Professor Rul Kumaran, will you wrap yeah, up I think, your um, questions on FGM and the last one and the rest? Okay, and I'll take the last one final first. Uh, final comments. Uh, when Stefan mentioned about the tip of the iceberg, it's because maternal mortality is something everybody knows when the mother dies. There is a funeral and everybody knows the mother <laughs> has died. What is below the water or the most of the iceberg is actually when the mother is maimed or has some injury. For example, in Africa, there are millions of women with what we call as a vesicovaginal or rectovaginal fistula. That means the head of the baby goes into the pelvis and they are in long labor for more than 24 hours and the pressure of the head on the bladder and the uterus or the vagina makes the tissue without any blood supply and that area sloughs off. And after the child is born, then they start leaking urine. So for their lifetime, they'll be starting leaking urine or sometimes the hole is on the back passage. So they start leaking feces, sometimes they leak both. And what happened to this woman is actually because she's smelling, she's put into a shed right behind the house in a garden and somebody goes and feeds and she doesn't feel like getting up. She squams herself into, uh, uh, doesn't move very much so she gets skeletal or muscular atrophy and she can't walk. There are a number of hospitals who do fistula repair. So that is one of the, and there are millions of women. The second is actually due to sepsis because they are in long labor, nobody is able to take care. Then they become infertile, they can't have any more children. Sometimes they have ruptured uterus and they bleed inside and they are taken in a moribund state. So there are a number and also it presses on the nerve, there are nerve, nerve palsies and so forth. So, when we say morbidity, morbidity, we are talking about 500,000 uh, women dying, but there are millions of women who have infection, anemia, fistula, and so on and so forth. So that is what quite important for us to recognize by simple measures, by knowing how the neck of the womb is dilating, what they call as a partogram, by plotting the cervical dilatation, and intervening early. If they have a health facility, they can avoid all these things. In the Olden days, they say, don't let the sun set twice on a laboring woman, because if it is too much of a long labor, all these complications can ensue. You can't apply that in Norway because of the midnight sun, but uh, in the African states, you can do that. Now, if I came to female uh, genital cutting, we call it, it's a rampant problem in Sudan, in Egypt, in many of the African countries. Now, the FIGO has been working with a committee called Sexual and Reproductive Rights Committee, where they meet with ministries, meet with the national organizations, they are trying to see how they can overcome the problem. Now the issue is a mammoth problem, as, uh, uh, as mentioned by the speaker, because it is cultural, it is religious, they can cause any amount of excuse for doing something. And that is, as the foreign minister mentioned, uh, the problem is there and the solution has to be within. Like in the UK, it's completely banned. They can go to prison, but nobody seems to... Well, in Egypt, there's a law, but still the, the procedure goes on in a hidden manner. So it's completely something which people had to work together. Not only international agencies, but people locally has to come out and make sure. So you are the youth, you are the current generation. 
And I'll be glad even in the next five or 10 years, if you make a revolution, like what the Egyptians have done now, to say, we are going to ban female genital mutilation. So the challenge is for you. So I will ask the president of the ISFIT to pass a resolution. The ISFIT members are saying in their own countries, they have mobilized their youth to make sure that the female genital mutilation is banned. I would be a very happy man. Thank you. I would like to comment on the, on the friend from Guatemala talking about midwives. It's very clear that different continents are very different midwives. And uh, Latin America stands out as uh, quite different from what happens in many other country, continents in the world. Uh, in the Western world, let's say the Americas, uh, uh, the whole system is very, very doctor-oriented for financial reasons and for cultural, historical reasons. I heard a figure uh, a couple of years back that the number of the percentage of of deliveries in the United States uh, where midwives are carrying out the deliveries below 5%. And that means that doctors are taking care of the, of the delivering woman in 95% or so. I don't know if that figure is still so, but it's enormously different from a country like my own, Sweden or Norway, where midwives cater to all pregnancies except those who are strictly pathological or uh, coupled with, with, with disease. So we have a very different world. And of course, when I talk about the Mozambican midwife, like Emilia Kumbane, the one we saw in the film, she has a three-year training, a very, very competent midwife. On top of that, she has four years of surgical training. So she becomes an obstetric surgical specialist with seven years of training. That is less than I have, is 12. And she is very capable of, of obstetric surgery. The, the friend looking after uh, shocking figures. Um, I think it's one reason why we have not seen the right way ahead. And I was brought up as a medical student with the false belief that high-risk pregnancies should be given priority and low-risk pregnancies should not be given priority. Now, that is completely false because if we look back the other way around and take 1,000 maternal deaths and just look who were they before they died, then we consistently will show that something in the range of 70 to 80% of those actually dying in maternal deaths are low-risk women, which may, doesn't make sense. But that is true because we don't have good risk factors for maternal deaths. We don't have it in Sweden. We don't have it in Mozambique. We don't have it in other countries. Because the trick is that when a mother dies, very often that is like a bolt from the blue without any sort of signs. For instance, a mother dying from postpartum bleeding we cannot predict who, which women will, will bleed to death. It's very difficult in any country. So we have been brought up with unscientific assumptions, which made the fact that we, we are very late in discovering the real efficient way of going ahead to reduce maternal deaths. Then this evening has come to a close. Now I would like to turn the attention to you. I think you've been a wonderful, wonderful audience. Um, and I have a limerick for you. <laughs> to participants here at ISFIT, do promise that you will all commit to full social justice and end to the malice. Let the evening inspire. You can do it. Get home, get home.